clients of um, now we're live streaming. Thanks, Steve. All right. So let's see. We got five today. So you got 20. So it takes about uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Of, uh, we have AI playtesting, X Room, uh, Interactive Academy, and August Wilson Cycle. That said, is AI playtesting all? I saw Rom and that. Oh, look at that. I see, I'm starting to see team. Team backgrounds. All right, we're going to speak over you, see Steve. If the team Steve. can please unmute, that will push you to the top of the uh, participant list, and that'll be easy for me to grab you from there, I hope. So do we start? Huh. One okay. second, he's grabbing you. We'll let him know if he's ready. Thanks. Okay, it didn't quite do that, but give me a second. <laughs> oh, Zoom. So quirky. There we go. I see Ram, I see CT. Ah, there's Danny. She home. Okay. All right. Whenever you all are ready. Post as disabled participant screen sharing. That would be Steve. Can you do that? Should be able to try now. There you go. All right, let's All right, start. Let's start. Okay. Hello, everyone. We are Team AI Playtesting. So next, uh, next, please. So our goal is to develop a reinforced learning agent to playtest a turn-based combat card game. And if successful, we try to help designer with game balance. So yeah, our instructors are Mike and Scott, and this is our team. We focus on two spaces. The first one is technical space. You know, machine learning is very good at some tasks like image detecting. We want to know if it's also good at something like playing games. Then this technical space will lead us to the design space. If it is good at playing games, how can we make use of this to provide information and insights on the game design? And actually, machine learning is not a new thing in game industry. A lot of game companies use this technique for their commercial games. For example, we use machine learning to find bugs. Ubisoft uses machine learning to create content like animation. And also, there are also some GDC talks about using machine learning in game AI. And then come to us, AI testing. So we are in the same field. We also use this same technique, but we have different goals. Instead of finding bugs or creating animation, we are using reinforcement learning, which is a type of machine learning to give feedback on the game design. And we work on a published popular game, State Spire. And next, Han, we'll talk more about this game. All right, thanks, Sichi. The game we are trying to implement is called Slate Spire. It is a deck building roguelike combat game, which players climb the spire, ascending its floor, and encountering many enemies and bosses. Along the way, the player will collect cards to build their deck and be ready for the final boss fight. The reason we choose Slave Spire is because of its complexity and freedom. On the reinforcement learning side, each combat has a finite state and action space, which makes our training much easier. In addition, our research result and experience can apply to other games with similar play style. In our project, we are not re replicating the entire game. We only implement the combat part of the game. We choose the boss guardian to implement our AI training is because this boss has a mechanism that requires a strategy to win the combat. If the boss re, uh, received a certain amount of damage, he will switch to defensive mode and cancel his next attack. The timing of triggering the defensive mode is actually a key factor of, result, of the result of the combat. We want our AI to learn this strategy through training and iterations. The default deck that we pick for the AI to train is right here. The reason we choose this deck is because it has a high win rate when human plays it, but it also has a very low win rate when, when a random bot plays it. The win rate could be a good reference for us to show how, how successful our AI is. 
The order of playing cards is also very important in this situation. For example, if we play an attack card before other buff cards, here buff cards means the card that can allow attack cards deals more damage or that the enemy receive more damage. It will only deal damage equal to the description on the cards. However, if we play a buff cards first and then play attack cards, for example, here we play flex at first and the following cards gets powered up. The damage of the attack cards will, in will increase a lot in this situation. Again, our AI will learn the strategy of playing cards in the right order through training and iterations. Next, Ram will give an introduction of re reinforcement learning. Thank you, Zahang. So we have talked about reinforcement learning. Uh, here's a quick description of what it is. Perhaps the most important feature of reinforcement learning is that the agent learns through actions, uh, through trying actions in an environment and experiencing rewards for these actions. Uh, the agent does not need to know the rules of the game before it starts training. This is in contrast to traditional AI, where you need to give it the rules of the game. Lastly, if the agent is trained well, the performance of a reinforcement learning agent can exceed expectations. So to see how a reinforcement learning agent would play the game, let's see how a human would play this game first. So the human takes in a lot of important information that's available on the screen. For example, player energy, player health, buffs on the boss, which could increase or decrease damage, boss health, boss intent, what is the boss going to do next, the cards in hand, the discard pile, and the draw pile. With all of this information uh, taken in, the human would then choose which card uh, they want to play. And then they would play the card. So let's formulate this as an RL problem. We have the reinforcement learning agent and we give it the observations of the current state of the game. Let's call this the game state. And the RL agent then converts this game state information into some other meaningful information that will help it decide which card to play. So to dive a little bit more into this, let's start with the game state with all of these variables that we just saw. Then we have the neural network, which can be thought of as being the brain of the AI agent. The neural network converts the game state information into expected rewards from playing each card. And if let's say card two has the highest expected reward, then the agent would play card two. So let's see a couple of demo videos now to, uh, to see this in action. So the first video is of a trained AI agent. This means that we have already spent time training this agent and it now knows how to play the game. Okay, thanks Ram. Let's look how AI plays a game. So let's start our game. So from the game interface, we can see there's a player, enemy, the cards on your hand, the energy, the deck, everything AI need to make a decision. And we can also see there's the numbers on the top of each card. And these numbers are the reward values we mentioned before. So AI yeah, think if you play a card with high reward, you have more chance to win. So now in this situation, we can see there's a 1.4 card. So it's the highest reward in this situation. So AI yeah, believe if you play this, playing this card is the best move. So we just play this card. Okay. So after we play this card, we can see the reward value changes. And this makes sense because AI make decision based on the situation. If the situation changes, it will have different strategy. And this is how it plays game. We can see the red numbers are very low reward value. This is because we don't have energy to play this card. So AI know it is not allowed it to play this card. So in this video, I just follow whatever AI told me. And we can see the AI try to figure out the right order, try to maximize the, the damage, the reward value in order to win the game. And AI, you try to use number to quantify every possible moves. So then playing game for AI, just all about picking numbers. So we can see there's uh, the highest reward value in this demo. It's because AI know if it play, play this card, it just win the game. Okay, now we, I will show you how we observe AI's behavior. So we also provide a tool to create scenarios. Let me give you some example. 
Uh, I don't want this card on my hand, so I remove this card just by clicking the button. So after I remove all of it, I want to, for example, I want to know what's the reward of another card in this situation. So I add this card from the database into the game. So we can see uh, the reward of this card defense. I can also turn this card into another one. So the, this allow, almost allows you to mo modify everything in the game set, including the HP of the player, HP of the boss, add a buff to combat unit, change the value of the buffs. So the reason why we do this is because we want to observe how AI react to these changes. We can see the reward value of the strategy will change even if we make a very little change on the game state. So on the one hand, Zener can create scenarios to say, okay, what's AI's opinion on my rule set? On the other hand, we programs can create test cases to see if AI can find a strategy. So next Ram will talk more about it. So this was an example of a trained AI uh, here is an Excel sheet of the AI uh, when it is training. So all of these rows are being filled in while the AI is training. Uh, each row corresponds to one game that the AI plays. You can see that there are 73,000 rows. Uh, perhaps the most important column is the win-loss column, which indicates whether the AI has won or lost that particular game. And on the right, you can see the win rate. Uh, and the win rate is divided into blocks of 1,000 games. Uh, you can see that over training, the win rate increases. So the other important uh, piece of information here is the card statistics sheet, which can be very nice for game designers. Uh, this has this includes all of the cards in the deck and their counts. The card play count indicates how many times each card was played during training. The opportunities utilized column indicates how many times was a card played when it was available. So for example, flex was played 96% of the times it was available to play. The average card play position indicates the average position of playing a card in a turn. So flex having a, a average card play position of 1.56 means that it is generally played as either the first or the second card in a turn. And here we have some graphs that visualize these statistics. Okay, so now we come to challenges uh, in our project. Uh, we have three major challenges. Uh, the first one is that training time is significantly long. On most days, if we make a change in the AI algorithm, we need to wait till the following day to see uh, how that ended up. Examples of reinforcement learning applied to complex card games are rare to find. Uh, and although we do find examples of reinforcement learning applied to other games of different genres, it is difficult to directly take their algorithms and apply it in our situation because the state and action space is very unique to each game. Uh, also, there's a sequential nature of moves or card plays in Slay the Spire, and this is difficult for even a human to learn, uh, and so much more so for the AI. Next, we'll talk about feedback from quarters. So uh, we got value about feedback from quarters. Um, so the first one is the deliverables. Um, so uh, we need a deliverable to show our work. So we're making a detailed technical report, which will be similar to Iseta engine. Another feedback is accessibility. So we're making graphical interfaces to make our product more accessible to designers. Another feedback is if we're stuck in AI training process, we need to seek external help. So we sought advice from a PhD student at CMU. So the next page shows the UI to make our product more accessible to designers. When you click on a button on homepage, you will go to another page that enable designers to create and edit cards. And there are two deliverables. The first one is a detailed documentation. We have started working on the detailed technical report. The details can be found here at the link below. You can also find it in a Zoom chat we just posted. Another deliverable is a playable prototype. So on the next page, this is the, the, the showing. And we created a home screen, which basically can control everything. Functions including a gameplay system, just like the demo showed game state runtime modifier, and the Excel sheet showing statistics. 
Our plan after half consists of three points. We are optimizing our AI agent, adjusting AI architecture to achieve higher win rate. We're going to make a technical report to record what we have done along the way. We're going to make our products more accessible to designers, make them playtest our prototype. In summary, we develop a reinforcement learning agent to play test a turn-based combat card game, more specifically, Slay the Spire. We plan to utilize graphical interfaces and statistics to help designers with game balance. We deliver our insights through documentation and a prototype. We are AI play testing. Now we're open for questions. So people can put their questions in chat. Dave and I can help moderate and read the questions out loud. And great job, team. Yay. Any questions? Share your slides, please. Stop sharing. Boom. Uh, question from Heather asking, did any, did your AI offer any surprises? Uh, there was a surprise, but it was a less exciting one. Um, so in order to teach the AI, uh, the legal moves, uh, we need to give it a negative reward to, to play the game, uh, to play an unplayable card. So let's say that defend a card called defend is not on your hand and the AI tries to play that we need to give it a negative reward to do that. Uh, if we made this negative reward lower than the negative reward for winning, uh, that is the only way it would work. Uh, what we did earlier was make it make it higher uh, than than actually losing the game. And as a result, it would play uh, the unplayable card and then lose by default uh, instead of actually trying to play the game. Yeah, that, yeah, that's I'll, like one. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah I'll add up with another example. Uh, one at one moment we use our AI to focus on different aspects of the game. Uh, one thing is AI only look at what's the cards on your hand. One thing is AI is only look at what the boss is going to do next. And we find the AI look at the boss is all what's going to next is much smarter, will have much higher win rate. So this is the case we think we don't know, we think the cards on your hand is the most important to play a card, but actually it's not. What's, what's more important in this rule set is what, what is unexpected. So this example, we think the statistic will give some result. We, we think it's not, yeah. So this is another example. A uh, question from Jesse. Jesse, you want to unmute and ask? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I guess I'm wondering, can you talk about, you talked about how humans have a 90% win rate with this particular deck. Uh, can you talk about what win rate have you achieved and, and does that meet your expectations? Uh, the current win rate that we are sitting at with the same deck is around 62 or 63%. Uh, that is a little lower than what we want. Um, but yeah, we, we are planning to improve that in the future. Okay, and what, what do you think is going to cause it to improve? What changes are gonna bring about improvements to that win rate? Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest uh, things that we need to try more with or like, uh, you know, test more with is reward function changes. So right now we have like a uh, elaborate reward function that tries to look at the value of playing each card. And uh, I think we need to make some changes to that. Um, whenever we make, changes to the reward function it does uh, like it it tends to favor some cards over the other the best way to do it of course is to just have a reward for winning and if we do that then over a lot of games the ai will uh, will figure out the trajectories that caused it to win and then reinforce those to cause more wins uh, but yeah i would say that we would start with the reward function to increase the win rate and you need to hand tune that is that right um, yeah, there, there are two approaches. Like we either do just plus one for winning, minus one for losing, or we hand tune it. And we are seeing that with hand tuning, uh, it does lead to better results. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mo, want to ask your question? 
Yeah, I was trying to uh, get to what design question you you're trying to answer. What, what what does this allow you to do? And remember specifically what kind of metric you would use to measure that. Um, I would like to say the uh, for using our uh, prototype uh, to answer the. Uh, the, the the major question that we're trying to answer is the the economy, mm -hmm. the balance of the the game, like each card and each deck, and what and what and how to mon uh, uh, adjust uh, numbers on cards or like tr trying to change your deck could affect your win rate, and uh, or this deck is too strong or this card is too strong. We can use use our uh, AI to to trying to uh, see because it does more. Uh, more testing with uh, with with play, so uh, it's 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 very easy to get uh, feedback and, and statistic by using this and to to balance the game. Uh, so one example of that is what you see on the screen. So this is uh, so we have the baseline deck that offers like a fifty seven percent win rate. This is uh, one week ago. Um, and if we add three copies of the different card to the same deck, then that changes the win rate by twenty nine percent. Uh, sorry, it, it reduces the win rate to 29%. Uh, instead, if we replace a, a card called Thunderclap with Bash in the same deck, then it improves the win rate by 4%, increases it to 61. Uh, and these are just the kind of uh, experiments that we have been doing. Uh, these experiments do take a long time because we need to keep uh, the AI for training every time we make a change uh, to the deck. And that, that does take time. All right, that's time for everyone. So thanks to uh, AI Playtesting. Good job, team. Thanks again. All right. So as we, as Steve starts unspotlighting you, he's also going to start spotlighting the next team, XR Room. You all can get ready. Turn your cameras and mics on so he can find you pretty quickly. And again, for everybody who joined us between the start uh, um, and now, if you can just keep your uh, cameras and your mics off if you're just watching and we will use chat to spotlight questions after the team presents. Check you out. Who am I missing? Let's see. Sally and uh, Leon. Sally and Leon, yeah. There's Sally. I'm looking, I'm looking. There we go. Whenever you're ready, team. Hey, let me share my screen. So let's start it. Um, welcome everyone to Project X Room Hub presentation. We are a team of six people that comes from diverse background. Our uh, advisor are Carl and Tom. And X Room is creating a multiplayer interactive uh, XR experience for uh, mobile devices uh, that people can enjoy in a, a room scale space. So our client are Jessica Hammer and Interdigital Communication, uh, which is one lead mobile technology research and development company. Uh, so they bring us like two visions. One is to e explore the interactive XR and the other is to utilize the edge computing and to showcase this technology. Um, so based on their uh, vision, we come up with like three uh, top project goals for our project. The first one is innovative. The second is discovery. And the third uh, is showcase. Uh, for showcase is because uh, our project, we will be shown uh, during the Mobile World Congress uh, 2021 in Barcelona. So now I will pass to Guiming to talk about what is edge computing. Thank you, Dumo. Now, what is edge computing? On the comparison of traditional cloud networking pattern, edge computing added a new layer between the devices and cloud named edge layer. Next. So edge computing work as a local cloud services that moving the computation away from the data center in cloud side to the edge of the network. So the new data center is much near the client side so that it can guarantee a high speed in transfer rate 
and a shorter response time. Next, for our project, the HCAM building can provide a low latency with high bandwidth network. So we can develop applications that communicating through the edge. Next, Brendan will talk about our ideations. Thanks, Quimin. Uh, so when our client came to us about the project, they had several pillars they wanted us to hit, uh, such as leaving the booth, multi-user feedback and haptics, creating an artifact that they can take home, spectation, tailoring the environment, image identification and processing, multi-user coordination, and complex real-time rendering. Uh, naturally, this would be a tall uh, order to fill for one project. So instead, our team uh, pitched a myriad of different ideas that all poked at these different pillars. Um, in total, we came up with 23 ideas that we pitched to our client over the span of three weeks, and we had reduced them down to three more okay. refined pitches, this and then we picked perfect, one. Which runs in the background oh. and, waits for you to perform the and so we went with head you reflectors um, for our project. Hand. So what exactly is head reflectors? And clap like this. So it's head fast reflectors fast. Uh, comes from more of a personal story of mine. Um, when I was in college, I did marching band. Um, and so our uniforms looked like this. And at the top of our uh, helmet, we had this circular disc, which a uh, fun fact is actually very reflective. Um, and so during some uh, rehearsals, um, the sun would hit us just right. You would have a spot on the ground where the reflection from the light came from. And so uh, this left an impression on me because it became a thing where we would try to reflect the light into someone else's face just to just kind of be annoying, but it was kind of fun. Uh, so I pitched this idea to our team and we kind of came up with this idea of a two player arena where you're trying to reflect light into people's faces. And uh, through talks, it just kind of ran away with this kind of complex idea where you're trying to bounce light off of mirrors around different obstacles um, to make this more uh, engaging environment, um, kind of like this one. Uh, so with this baseline idea in place, I'm going to pass it off to Sally to talk about how we're bringing this uh, idea to life visually. All right. Thanks, Brendan. So after nailing down the idea and getting our client's approval, uh, we went ahead and we started brainstorming different concepts for our overall experience. Some of uh, one of our project goals is actually to showcase this at a conference space. So our team believe it was actually very important that we pick a theme that would attract a wide demographic. We focus on the ideas that we thought would be fun and wouldn't prevent people from wanting to try out our game. So we pitched our client ideas ranging from 80s disco to futuristic sci-fi, and our client was really excited with our disco arena theme. So after we got her approval on this concept, we further iterated on what we wanted, what we believe to be our final vision, and our team began creating 3D models to begin early staging and blocking up the environment. So at this stage of our project, we're still iterating the overall game loop and we're discussing whether it would be a better idea to actually potentially um, deem the physical conference space. So right now we're more focusing on polishing the core game account before we go back and we expand on environmental assets. So now I'll pass it to Leon to showcase what we created so far in our demo. Uh, thank you, Sadie. So here's what we got for our demo. Uh, so firstly, uh, after two users get into the uh, game, they have to scan the same uh, marker as you see as the QR code to place the AR world in the real world space in the same position. So here you can see the virtual environment that we put in the AR space and people can see it. And after people initialized their AR space in the real world, they can use their phones as a reflector to reflect the rays from the disco ball and use the reflected ray to shoot each other. And you, here you can see on screen, the red text indicates the health points of both players, which indicates the, how, uh, uh, indicate how they hit or they hit each other. So for this demo, we really wanted to just um, work on the two main parts of our design, uh, the fact that it's multiplayer and the fact that we're reflecting light into another person uh, using a mirror, just for the sake of getting things together before it happens. Um, uh, from a design point, our main concerns uh, following our motion sickness, uh, as you can see from the video, both of our play testers were using uh, phones in their hands instead of on their heads. 
we had done a lo-fi play test prior to this. Um, we're just using mirrors of holding above your heads. And we found that uh, for those uh, reflecting light by shifting your head wildly can be a little more motion sickness inducing to those who are prone. So we're looking into alternative control schemes. Currently holding it in your hand seems to work the best, but it's still not a solid question. Um, for the gameplay loop right now, we just have the reflecting light, which in our design works for a competitive space, but it also lends itself to a cooperative space as well. Um, we are looking to see if we can tow the line of competitive and cooperative for our final experience to make a much more enriching game experience. Um, the game itself supports currently two phone devices, but uh, to show off Edge Tech's Internet of Things, we're also considering putting more phones on players, say like putting them on your elbows and your knees to have more reflection points or more hit points um, if the gameplay loop needs to be more engaging. Um, and we're also looking to bring the real world space to the play field. Um, as with any AR game strives to be, we are trying to um, bring our real world environment into our game. And we're trying to do this through things like dynamic occlusion. Um, when we originally pitched the design, the idea of having boundaries was a thing. And because we want to try occlusion, we want to see if uh, we can get real objects to block light to make for a more dynamic gameplay space for the players. But these are more technical questions to answer. Um, so I will now pass it off to Leon to talk about what we did technically for our demo. Uh, thank you, Brandon. So uh, uh, for achieving our uh, AR shared experience of multiplayer game, we, divide, uh, we divided our solution, technical solution into three steps. So the first step will be the two users scan the same marker. As you can see, is the QR code. And to get the physical transform, uh, transform of both players, and we are using the AR Foundation package to do this step. Next, we will get and send the relative position of both players in the AR space, uh, in the marker space, which will means the position, rotation, and the other physical data of the players. And we will send this data from the uh, from Unity to the edge part, which means the front end to the back end. Next. So the third part, uh, third step will be retrieving the calculated data from the back end. Uh, we are doing this step. Uh, we calculated the light, ray, lasers, different uh, environment, uh, environment data from the back end, and we will retrieve the, them from the edge part to our unity part, as we can see uh, the player's phones. Next. So, so far now, we have some technical concerns about our, our technical part. The first will be the relative transform how we get relative position and rotation of both players that's based on the same marker in the space. And that will be the initialization, how we get stable initialization place that during the image tracking process. And the third problem will be the occlusion, how we got a good occlusion that plays the real world things mixed with the AR world. And the final concern is about is how we can get a stable connection between our phones, the front end, and edge system, the back end. Next, I will pass to Doris to talk uh, more about art assets. Thanks, Leon. Since our client will bring this project to conference GSMA, we are currently unable to determine the demography and identity of the attendees. In this case, we need to design more intuitively for naive guests. So for our gameplay interface, attendees just need to scan QR code to set the scene, then to play. We set the timing system, health system, and score system in our game so that attendees can see the information directly when they in-game. Also, we are thinking about utilizing environment and AR techniques to create a smoothly user experience. For the health system, we make the type of center model. For score system, we will create a score bar in environment. Players can scan the score bar through hazard to know the score. For a timing system, we can utilize the change of beating speed to let the players know the time. Or if we need, we can add some design later. Next, please. Here are some art concerns of our team. In order to enable attendees to get feedbacks when they hit by another player, the reflective light is essential in our game. We are going to create a compelling particle system to let the attendees get feedbacks. 
So the particle system and the visualization of light is important for our next step. Another concern is decoration of booth. Since we aren't sure about the details for the size and outlook of the booth during current situation, decoration of the booth in, is unsure part as well. Then I will pass back to Dongmeng to talk about our next step. Well, uh, thanks, Doris. So as you can see, that's um, what we have done so far. So we focus on idea iteration and um, basic prototype building for this half semester. Uh, so after, uh, so for the next half of the semester, we will um, recap our feedbacks and we'll do design iteration and sync iteration. After that, we'll switch to like fully developing mode and actually building the game through multiple play tests. And we will use the final week or two weeks to do our final polishing and get the final delivery ready. So and here is our top three uh, matrix. So, um, and we are team Xroom. Uh, we are creating a multiplayer interactive uh, XR experience for a mobile device that people can enjoy in a room scale space. Um, thanks everyone. And we are open to questions. Great job team, yay. Congratulations. Uh, and just put some questions in the chat. Anybody have them? And Dave will help call on you. We can unmute and ask. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so I asked uh, if multiplayer will get beyond two player, and if so, when? Because I know you're you have some challenges about how you're going to play test uh, during these COVID times. So I'm just curious, how much are you pushing multiplayer, and to how many people? Uh, currently, it is still just two player. Um, we do want to explore multiplayer uh, with like three or four. Um, the, the point being, it, we will have to see what our limitations are for testing in places like BTC because this game does require external hardware from the phone in order to run properly. Um, but yeah, we do we do want to uh, play test with more people in the future. Uh, that's more down on the line when we have more of an iterated game loop. Uh, question from Jesse. Yeah, can you guys just say a little more about how this particular demonstration uh, demonstrates edge computing? Yeah, I think um, for um, this demo, we uh, use the, the first part of like edge computing is the connection of uh, uh, multiple uh, devices. So uh, right now we only have two phones, but we are trying to explore, explore to the opportunity by using more phones, like maybe one in the arm, like the shield. So each player maybe have two or three phones. So they will be in this kind of experience that require a very low latency that which uh, the edge computing uh, can really help. And also if you are wondering about how we can then show the edge computing part, it's actually in the, uh, the advanced edge computing technology our client provide. Uh, they, are, they have like um, data stream that can be shown uh, in the, another monitor inside the booth. So the people will can see uh, actually the data stream and the latency uh, and how well the edge computing is working. Yep. So our client InterDigital, they have the each computing platform, the name is Advantage. So we can use a monitor to show the current edge running state, like the latency and the speed and the speed between the nodes. So we could use the web-based UI to show how the powerful the edge computing is. Got it. Yeah, the low latency of the body motion. That that makes sense. Yep. Ralph, you go ahead. So what so um what's what's gonna be your biggest challenge? Uh, to get, uh, what, what is your biggest challenge you're facing right now? Mm 
you want to take you, Leon, for uh, programming? Uh, yeah, uh, for sure, yeah. Uh, so for technical parts, we have uh, some big challenges, like uh, how to guarantee the multiplayer's, uh, multiplayer's position is very accurate in the airspace, because you can see the demo, it's kind of a little bit floating problem because of the uh, latency of the network or, and also about like the light, light, uh, light and different factors in the environment that will uh, that will uh, make the uh, the initialization not that correct. So we are like finding some ways to get better in initialization and also try to deep uh, to dig deep in more possible solution for the occlusion problem. Yeah, from a design standpoint, um, the biggest challenge comes in making the experience just feel good. Um, uh, primarily, because one half is the fact that we need to have uh, enough people to play test in order to make sure that we're doing the right steps in order to make it feel good. Um, but since the game was originally supposed to be played with the reflective surface above your head, the light was never meant to go directly in your face and back out the screen. So you may have saw from the demo that the, like the light beam seems to clip when it hits the, the plane, just because that's how uh, assets normally work in Unity. Uh, and so like talks between design and art right now, we're trying to figure out how to make reflecting light off of like basically the equivalent of like a transparent mirror seem good, uh, essentially. Yeah, yeah. One other question. What, what instrument did you play in a band, Brandon? <laughs> I played trumpet. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say that's time. So that's a good job, team. Congratulations. And we'll, uh, Steve will un, um, spotlight you and then get ready to spotlight our next team up for the day. Interactive Academy. You can turn your, turn your mics on, your cameras on so you can easily find you. Once again, for those who joined us, uh, the teams will present. If you can keep your cameras and mics off during the presentation, they have 15 minutes and then we will do Q&A through the chat where Dave will help call on you so you can un unmute yourself and ask your question. All right, um, should we start? Mm, not quite, hold on. We got four of you, who are we missing? We have six of us. We're missing you phone. Wait, wait. Gloria. Somebody's not muted. Oh, that's another wrong team. Sorry. Um, would it be easier if everybody unmute? I think I might have it. Um, Wait, he is not on the team. No, no he's not. not. Um, he's also on our team. team. He should be on the other Oh, Ranja, where are you? Yeah, using the participant view has got its own challenges because things jump around constantly, so I'm chasing things. But I think I have it. Gotcha. Yep, you're over there. All right, um, whenever you're ready. All right. Hello, we're Team Interactive Academy, and this is our house presentation. This is our team. Our advisors are Shirley and Mo, and our clients are the Anima Dallas Research Group. So our project goal is to build a highly interactive experience for middle schoolers that sparks interest in STEAM subjects while leveraging lessons from the educators on the Inanimate Alice team. We're providing examples, prototypes for the Inanimate Alice research group in the future, as opposed to making a completed product. We're putting on an equal focus on narrative and literacy, as well as game moments such as puzzles that are meant to be a bit more interactive. We're making an experience that is just more than just a game. We're presenting STEM knowledge in a fun way through 
puzzles and indirect controls that make students get over their fear towards STEM, but we're not teaching STEM. So what is Inanimate Alice? It is an ongoing digital novel that uses interactive multimodal fiction. It relates to the experience of aspiring game designer Alice and her imaginary friend Brad in episodes, journals, and other digital media. Our clients look to branch out in Anima Dallas into the STEM field as there is high level economic interest and more students gaining STEAM skills. Retaining the original immersive literacy approach while teaching STEM is a unique proof of concept. We decided to teach STEM through game development, which encompasses a number of STEAM subjects. Based on our pitch and research, we decided to go for the kinesthetic learning approach, which emphasizing on uh, learning through doing and focused on teaching, uh, teaching game development through game-like moments. However, game development is an extremely broad topic, so we decided to focus on creating two chapters that focuses on computer science as well as texturing. An intro and overworld is used to bridge the chapters. Our experience will happen in between episode five and six in terms of timeline. Our metrics matrix are client requirements, innovation, and gameplay slash interactivity. Next, I'll head it over to Lawrence, who will talk about design process. Thanks, Karen. So to start, we looked at related work in the field, such as the previous episodes from the Anatom and Alice series. We also looked at titles like Oregon Trail and Physicus, which bring classroom lessons to life, games like Minecraft and Code Spells, which utilize more of a sandbox approach for their content. And finally, things like Alice's Adventure and Scratch were instrumental in helping us design puzzles revolving around coding and programming concepts. When it came to quarters, we received a lot of feedback and appreciate everyone that was able to take the time to come visit us. Scope was a big concern, and as such, we cut down our number of chapters from three to two to focus more on how we're delivering the content as well as polish. Leaning on frameworks given to us by our client, as well as design frameworks such as the transformational one to help lower barriers for students to feel more comfortable with STEAM subjects, allow us, allows us to create a little bit more of a map in how we're delivering said content. And finally, our documentation is going to be vital. Not, not, not only in showing how uh, we're achieving certain things, but also explaining why. Next, we're going to look at a short video highlighting our experience thus far. ...to other Inanimate Alice episodes, utilizing UI elements to guide the player in advancing the story when they are ready. In this story, Alice is transferring data from her old device to her new one when something goes wrong. She goes into her device and enters a world where she must find her digital friend Brad. Each microchip represents a chapter of content. The player explores the space using the mouse and clicks on objects to interact with them. We see the computer is locked. However, an access card is close by. When the player clicks on specific items, they go to the inventory bar for later use. Alice's observations appear on screen to provide context as well as subtle hints. After exploring, the player sees an interesting cube. This is a code block, the main piece of this chapter. Code blocks contain bits of code that the player can input into the computer to advance. After inserting the code blocks in the correct order, a new puzzle appears. This is portrayed as a standard jigsaw puzzle, but some pieces appear to be missing. Exploring further, certain objects transform into the remaining pieces, or mind fragments. A pixelation effect is used to amplify the digital nature of the world as the objects transform. Completing the puzzle, the player will be shown a new puzzle with new challenges. So when it came to some design, design decisions, we landed on a 2D first-person point-and-click game like you saw. This has numerous parallels to the Anatomy and Alice series, not only in the main mechanism of using the mouse to interact with the world, but also in the intimate first-person player uh, perspective. The RICS framework given to us by our client, which stands for Read, Imagine, Create, and Share, is ingrained in a, in a lot of the interactive moments in our experience, especially since, since we're leaning so heavily on text. And finally, game development concepts such as programming logic and textures as chapter topics are an engaging way to draw out Steam parallels. When it comes to the narrative, we saw some key moments in the video, specifically the inciting incident in which Alice's new mobile device gets corrupted during a data transfer. Not only are her files lost or broken, but her digital friend Brad, who she's been with since the beginning of the series, is lost as well. Obviously, we're taking a lot of influence from inanimate Alice's style, not just in the primary characters of Alice and Brad, but also in the general ambiguity of the work. This allows, uh, this leaves holes open for students to kind of dig through and explore on their own, talk with their classmates, and come to some of their own conclusions. 
In short, we're looking to emulate this style, not straight copy it, in order to pave a new story forward for Alice and others to experience. Now, our experience is taking place during a very transitional period in Alice's life. She's 17, she's on the verge of graduating high school, and there's a juxtaposition going on of moving forward with your life versus looking back at the past and going down memory lane, as it were. Uh, this is not only seen in the objects Alice interacts with, which are all from past episodes, but also in her observations of said objects. And finally, there's an equivocation here that her, Alice's goals in the digital world echo her ambitions in the physical world in the sense that she wants to use her game dev knowledge to, quote, build a better world for herself. Next, Jamie will talk a little bit about the tech side. Thank you, Lawrence. Chapter Zero is a prologue of our story. It involved the content from Alice receiving a new player to diving into the digital world to use all of her game development knowledge to fix and find bread. Chapter Zero is interactive heavy. A narrative heavy, so therefore point and click technique is implemented to make narratives move forward. For example, as you can see in these pictures, after the text fades into the scene, an arrow-like button shows up for clicking and then move next. And we also made some of the elements in chapter zero interactable. For example, in order to make the data transfer between these two players, children need to click on them separately and a status window will pop up on the player for, the, for this click feedback. We also added some virtual effects to make the story more vivid and understandable, including glitch effect during the data transfer failure and the dissolve effect when bread goes missing. And talking of our world, it's designed at the circuit board of the new player. Three black processors represent three chapters. So in one puzzle can make some of the wires connect to the center processor, which is a main power to run the player. When all the puzzles are solved, the center processor will run successfully, which means bread is back into function. When children first get into it, only chapter one is unlocked. They can click on the flashing processor to enter this chapter with puzzles. So now I'll hand to Rongjia to talk about some more details. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so as Jamie mentioned, chapter one will start after clicking on the first processor. Unlike chapter zero, chapter one is focusing on puzzles where puzzle building is one of the most important parts. Each puzzle is composed by clickable and draggable elements. Some objects in the game world can be collected and put into the inventory while well, some are static items like furniture. Clicking them will bring players to another view or continue the story. In most point and click puzzle games, inventory is a recurring theme. Guests can check all the items that they have collected and use them to solve puzzles. We also added an inspector to the inventory to show details and give hints. Narrative is essential to storytelling. To keep players engaged in this digital world, we rely on dialogues and texts. When guests are clicking on something, Alice will either explain it or hint at the next step. Also, as a main feature, guests can chat with Brad after fixing a corrupted device, which is mainly made up with dialogues. Our deliverables are very likely to be used by our client's dev team later. So our tech team has been trying to make our handoff as structured and readable as possible. First, we're using abstractions to keep the code structured. Second, to keep our project clean and extensible, we're trying to apply useful and meaningful, meaningful design patterns like singleton, observer, and state. Last but not least, we have been using Unity Editor extension, keeping our code clean and commented as draft and drafting documentation. Next, Sally will talk about the art progress and iterations. Thank you, Rongjia. For the visual style of this experience, we wanted to go with something that draws from the previous episodes of Inanimate Alice. We noticed that most of the imagery had very tinted undertones of green, red, and brown. We wanted to retain this emotion, but also find a way to ingest digitalness into our world. We fused our digital color palette with the inanimate Alice color palette style that we thought would be a relatable reflection of Alice's stone within a backseat player world. We also adapted the softer lighting from episode five to light our scene. We had thought of a 2D point and click, which meant we could want to cater to the following needs of the game. Exploration with multiple camera angles, detail with lighting and quality, and a first person perspective. Initially leaning towards 2D, we did a 2D illustration art test. Second, we did a 3D world, but with a 2D outlines test. Building on that, we removed the outlines and did a natural render of a 3D world test, which we felt catered best to the requirements of our experience in the following ways. It was relatively more engaging and visually compelling. It offered more perspective experimentation. It gave us flexibility for rendering different camera angles. We could experiment with lighting and it gave us world building liberty, both in terms of quality and time. 
The old Baxi player was inspired from the Baxi player seen in episode 5. We plan to make the newer design more sleek and sophisticated and reflect more digitalness to go in sync with the ambience of our game. Most of the background were dimly lit. Therefore, we went for lighter colors that would stand contrast for the scene navigation icons. The chapter one world is the control room of Brad in the backseat player. Essentially for this style of the game, it is a user interface that should be clean, intentional and expressive. We Bradified the room by placing all of Brad's artifacts throughout the episodes. There were multiple surfaces in the rooms which gave us a good room for puzzle collectibles and interactables to be placed. The world had to be chaotic and corrupted. We planned to have solid colors for the environments and the only object and the objects that served importance would have more level of detail. Lighting cues were used for indirect control. The main element of chapter one's first puzzle is the computer screen. Therefore, it was the most brightest area in the whole room centered in between so that the player immediately explores it. Multiple cameras were placed in the room for exploration. Code blocks were the pivotal elements of chapter one. We visualized code as digital information in form of bits, which when magnified looked like tesseracts. Inspired by this, we built an MSM neon blue code block following our visual style. For the mind fragments, we envisioned them as jigsaw blocks with a sem similar MSM style seen for code blocks. Sherry will now talk about playtesting. Thank you, Sally. Up until now, we've conducted two playtesting sessions with 11 middle schoolers aged 12 to 13. The difficulty ratings of the puzzles show a bell curve distribution with a peak in the middle, which was in line with our expectations. And in terms of how engaging the puzzles were, we also got a bell curve with a peak at five out of seven, and most of our playtesters showed interest in playing more similar games in the future. Despite the fact that our experience was incomplete, we think there's still room for improvement and will iterate on our design to make it more engaging. We also receive useful information from students, playtest survey responses and conversations with teachers. We receive responses like, I would add instructions for when you're in the escape office because I was not sure what to do, indicating that the usability of experience still need to be improved and more hints and indirect control elements are needed to better guide them through the experience. But at the same time, we also got responses like, I'm more interested in STEM because now I want to make a cool game. From these responses, we can see that the kids seem to be engaged with the challenging puzzles in game and they became more interested in making games. This gives us the confidence that we are on the right track using game development concepts in game environment to, start, to spark their interest in STEAM subjects. Also, we've learned from the teachers that most of the students use Chromebooks and they're not allowed to install any software that's not being approved due to safety concerns, which means our original PC build won't work on their Chromebooks. Therefore, we decided to upload the web job build on Simmer.io so that our playtesters can easily access it in the browser. However, there might be some potential risks of using WebGL. Some visual effects and interactions can be problematic. So currently we're still using WebGL build only for the playtesting before doing enough research and officially switching to WebGL build. So here's our future plan. We'll finish basic functionalities of chapter two by the end of week 11 and spend another two weeks polishing our experience according to the playtest feedback as well as working on the documentation part. And finally, we'll wrap up everything and hand it off to our client before the last week. Special thanks to all the teachers, playtesters, and faculty members, especially John Bailash, who has been generous in taking time to provide feedback and facilitate playtesters for us. So to summarize, we're our team interactive academy. We're building a highly interactive experience for middle school students that sparks interest in STEAM subjects while leveraging lessons from the educators on the inanimate Alice team. We're now open for questions. All right, great job team, congratulations. So any questions, if you got, put them in the chat and Dave will call on you.
All right, I waited 30 seconds. I think you all left him speechless. Wait, question on text. All right, Mike, go. <laughs> yeah, uh, one, of, one of the comments you said was that you're leaning heavily on text. And it's just interesting because you're dealing with middle schoolers who maybe don't want to read text for an interactive game. So can you talk about that contrast between your demographic and leaning heavily on text? Sure, so one of the things that in Adam Nellis does as a, a multimodal fiction is utilize text as the main way to deliver the story. There are images, but the backbone of it is delivered on text. We wanted to include this in our experience as well, uh, not, not only to tie into the previous episodes of Anatomy and Alice and its style, but also to push more on uh, reading literacy and comprehension, which is a big part uh, of our clients' expectations. So to that end, we're trying to bridge that gap of interactions fuel the text and thereby text can also fuel what you want to do in terms of interactions and trying to have it as much of a symbiotic relationship as possible. All right, we, do, we have time for one more. All right, congratulations team, good job, thank you. So if you all, Steve's gonna unspotlight you and for the next team up, if you could just uh, not unmute yourself. Steve says it's easier to find you if you don't unmute yourself. So August Wilson, he's gonna find you and spotlight you and then we can get going. I see one. Theory invalid. Go ahead and unmute. All right, unmute. Help him find you. Got two. Oh, do we have one more member, um, Shulton? Yeah, he just needs to turn his video on. It's not letting oh, me yeah. spotlight him since his video. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, there he is. Oh, what's your name? We're missing, we missing Shara? You're missing oh, Shara, yeah. yeah. Is she there? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. There she is. Boom. All right, whenever you're all ready. Yep. Uh, let's start. Hello, everyone. We are Team August Wilson Cycle. We are working with our client, August Wilson House. And our advisors are Mike and Ralph. We are a team of four ETC students and a drama school grad student. Let's start with the project brief. August Wilson House is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the re revitalization of August Wilson's childhood home and Hill District. Our team aims to create an immersive experience that will help guests learn more about people and culture found in August Wilson's work. We hope to engage the guests with the Hill District that August Wilson lived in and used as an inspiration for his place. Our target user is high school students. We are going to use the mobile phone as the main platform with AI interaction. And our main content is the history and culture of the Hill District. We choose high school students because our client has a plan to create a class curriculum about August Wilson so we thought it would be a good opportunity to implement our application in a real life setting. 
Mobile learning is getting popular and it can facilitate improvement to learning experiences. According to the survey, 94% of students want to use their cell phones in class and 75% believe it has improved their ability to learn and retain information. Regarding the content, we got inspiration from August Wilson's interview. He appealed to young Black people to look to the African continuum as inspiration for their cultural preservation. To fully understand and appreciate his place, students should know about the whole history and the culture of the Hill District. Our application should be an interesting supplemental resource for high school students. This should help to engage the guests with Hill District through an interactive and immersive experience. And the whole experience will present authentic slices of the Hill District history and culture. Next is about design concepts. Players will be a time traveler and experience a historical moment of Hill District through interactive storytelling. We decided to focus on important time periods showing the changes of the Hill District with August Wilson's Pittsburgh cycle, which is a series of 10 plays throughout the 20th century. In the Pittsburgh cycle, there is a mythic character called Aunt Esther, claiming to be 349 years old. She is a recurring character in several of Wilson's plays. So we choose her as our main NPC who will help our playable characters throughout the whole time period. To start our application, first user need to print out the paper map of the Hill District and it will be used with teacher's guide in the classroom setting. And user can explore Hill District in AR and encounter various NPCs through three episodes. We believe AR is more appealing to high school students than a 2D mobile game. And we want to maintain a connection with the real world environment using physical map and AR. Next, Sultan will showcase our demo video. Thanks, Yun. And this video um, showcases the gameplay or user flow in one of our three time periods, which is the 1969. We started in Aunt Aster's house. The player meets Aunt Aster. The player receives some tasks from Aunt Aster, which is basically giving some notes to folks in the Hill District. And going back to the AR street environment, where the player can control an avatar walking around, there are several buildings that have exclamation marks, which means they can be explored. Going in one of the buildings, we enter a 2D scene again, and we can talk with NPCs and give them correct notes according to what they said. Um, once you talk with an NPC, and give the correct note, they will give you an item as a thank you to Aunt Aster. And the player can keep track of the notes and the items in the top left item bar. In the AR street scene, we have another mechanism, which is you can only find the entrance of the building when you are viewing that building in a specific angle. So our user will rotate the map to find the building. Uh, entrance of the building. And also we're adding some interactive elements in each scene in order to make the scene have the feeling of that specific time period, just like this jukebox. Once we have all the notes delivered, going back to the AR street scene, the Aunt Aster's house gets highlighted, which means we should return to Aunt Aster. And this is the end of this time period. So next, I'll briefly introduce our tech stack. Uh, we're using Unity as our game engine. We assemble assets and build the game logic in Unity. And for the AR solution, we are using the Unity AR Foundation module. Essentially, it is just a high-level abstract module of AR Core and AR Kit. For your information, AR Core is uh, AR library for Android devices, whereas AR Kit 
is the AR library for iOS devices. Uh, with the help of Unity AR Foundation, our app can be compatible with both Android devices and iOS devices. So we're aiming at releasing our app on both platforms. And next, Am will talk more about our storytelling. Thank you, Zoltan. So for our storytelling, uh, the main theme and message that we want to convey is the reconnection with history and the ancestors who lived in that history, in particular in Black history. And the daily interactions and culture that August Wilson experienced in the Hill District is what inspired him to create his place. So we want to base it off of that. The tone and emotion uh, that we want to convey is a sense of hope and connection. Uh, overall, we want the experience to be a celebration of the people and culture in the Hill District. The player's story is she is a modern young black woman. She ends up time traveling to three different time periods linked with the Pittsburgh cycle and she learns more about the history and culture of the Hill District through that in um, relating to how August Wilson wanted young black people to connect with the African continuum. For our 1969 episode, we took inspiration from his one play, Two Trains Running, which takes place in the same year. Uh, there are also two iconic places in the Hill District that we've used, Eddie's Restaurant and Crawford Grill. Eddie's is also referenced in Two Trains Running as Memphis's Diner. Now I'll pass it on to Gloria for interaction design. Thanks, Anne. And I'm going to introduce our interaction design. So our story structure is comprised by three time period that guests will travel through. And with the different time periods, the player experiences the same story structure, but centered around the time they're in. So the entire user flow of the game will happen after the onboarding section. The player will receive a mission from End Easter and then travel to the AR scenes to explore, explore the Hill District area in certain time period. And player will go into the certain building and enter the story episode. During the 2D scenes, the player will interact with NPCs and complete the task. After finish all the tasks, the player will return to an Easter and go back home. And here is our UI design principle. I try to keep our UI design high intuitive, e easy to understand, and also be cohesive to our art style. And here is our AR interaction exploration. And there are two fixed UI on the screen. And the top left is, uh, and the top left is the quest list, and the top, the bottom of the left is the direction controller. Uh, there are also several movable UI based on the models, including the finished task hint and unfinished task hint, which which will give player direction about which way they should go. In order to identify each buildings, the name of buildings will pop up when the player walking closer. In a 2D sense, the dialogue is the most important method to de deliver our story to audience. So I developed several versions of dialogue box. For example, the first version is about dialogue box will appear on the top of each character's head. And the second version is that the box will appear on the bottom of the screen, which is more suitable for displaying long task. And the answer, will the answer option will appear on the left of the dialogue box. So we try to implement the second version to our prototype first. Um, during reading the dialogue and choosing the answer, player can better understand the development of the story and also enhance the feeling of engagement. We are still exploring the best font colors that works well in mobile. Chat bottom will appear when the young black woman character get closer to certain NPC who is able to talk and return button will appear when she goes back get closer to the edge of the scenes. And this pop-up bottom can be easily noticed. Uh, will not destroy the balance of the picture and the rhythm of the story. Uh, this are the request object given by the NPC. And there are some iconic features either have significant in time period or significance in the play. When I designed those quest icon, I took the photos from 1960 as reference and I keep, I keep the hand draw art style and make the icon looks more realistic. And next, Cheryl will introduce our art design. Thanks, Gloria. Our art concept for drawing 2D scenes is basically between 2D fast cut and paste style and 2D stereo design with depth. Also, we used minimal colors because it helps us create a consistent tone in a more efficient way. And to enrich the scene, 
sense of historical context, we used granny brushes and the textures. Since we're not familiar with this history, we first look over photos and set designs to find iconic features like the items and marking orange oval here, which can represent a specific time period and tell the environment of the story. You wouldn't see this markup of Jack's in a sense and movie. First, this is Edis Brown's at his restaurant, where August Wilson often went in, listened to others' conversation, absorbed them, and fulfilled to his place. For this scene, we used brown color mainly and used blue as a side color to make it contrast the balance. And to get this scene done within multiple iterations, we started with a more flat style in a consideration of our capability. We then realized we need to create more depths in the scenes to make plumper and deeper visual experiences. We then decided to create a floor to walk on, which not only helps create a depth significantly by making all the objects backward a little bit, but also the patterns on the floor depict that time period. Moreover, uh, we added more elements such as the joke box on the right, one of the representatives of that time, to help our player recognize and get back to this time period before being told immersively. And this is on Astor House in, in the 1969 time period. Detailed elements are like stairs, shelves, rocking chairs. The colors we used here are all in orange tone to create a warm and cozy atmosphere, as is the house of Aunt Esther, who is the sad and symbol of Black history in the place. And this is Crawford Grove, where August Wilson often listened to the blues. Many murals there had counter stage or the unique features in the Crawford Grove, so we added them here. And for this scene, we used orange and dark purple here because these two are the color representative of jazz music. In a prototype we showed earlier, we implemented free 3D assets for the AR world. And unfortunately, due to the constraint time and energy, we plan to buy proper 3D model sets to recreate this scale district area. Of course, if available, we will adjust the textures and models a bit more to better display certain historical contexts. Next time we'll talk about her character design process. So for the process of the character um, art concept and style, we're following the environmental 2D art style aimed to create a flat paper cutout like style. We wanted to do a more simple approach to avoid having too much detail since this is on a smaller screen as a mobile app. We wanted to use colors that mix well with the environments and also colors that uh, fit that particular time period in that particular episode. So for reference for this particular episode, the 1969 one, we've used uh, Teeny Harris photos as a reference, photos from the late 60s, as well as the Black is Beautiful movement that was popular then, particularly for hair references and other fashion trends at that time. So this is the progress on the characters so far. We have the pirate and Esther, as well as the interactable NPCs, and our final uh, musician we have currently for Crawford Girl. As a next step, we are planning to finalize 1969 episode by week 9 and the whole narrative design by week 11. In the meantime, you'll find 3D assets for AR and merge it by week 11. After that, we are going to polish our application through multiple play tests and then deliver it by end of the semester. Um, this is the end of our slide. Thank you for um, taking your time today. If you have any questions, we will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yep, I will Chris. stop sharing. Okay. All right, great job, team. Oh, so you've already got one question in there. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, I have to unmute. So um, my assumption is that you're going with the map instead of using AR in the actual space because some of the landmarks are missing or not really accessible anymore. Is that right? Um, um, I'm not sure I understand. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, ask it, I'll ask it a different way. The Hill District is still there. Um, right. Why didn't you just, if you're using the phone, have the user walk around the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, actually, we discussed that idea when we start our project, but due to the COVID, uh, everyone should quarantine in their house. So we a little bit detour our uh, usage of AR. So we wanted to make, um, um, we still wanted to make a connection with the real environment in Hill District, but we wanted to augment 
a hill district area in the map, so everyone can enjoy the hill district exploration in their on their desk at home. Okay. Uh, Ricardo? Yeah, um, so you guys mentioned that your audience prefers AR, they, they like AR. Uh, my question is, how does AR serve your design? Why, why do you think it's the best choice? Especially, um, so you guys are dealing with the transition. You're going from an AR walk around to what I'm, I'm guessing the curtain closes, it opens up and then we're back into a full screen um, 2D version on your phone. How does that transition feel and how are you handling that? And what, what challenges are you running into with that? Yeah, uh, I think I can speak to that question. So this is a good question because the AR thing overall is our one of our biggest dilemma. Um, we have a bunch of good choice, uh, good reasons to keep AR, such as it is a main attraction to high schoolers. And uh, a most important reason is we found that it is meaningful to uh, for us to explore how we can combine the AR environment with the 2D pieces intuitively. So including providing information and performing indirect control in AR scene and also designing the transition between AR and 2D scenes, does it feel natural? Is it intuitive? Um, and we are still keep working on this transition designing. So for example, uh, when we are about to leave the AR scene, uh, we could see the AR environment through the windows and doors in the 2D scene, and then we do the transition. Uh, that's one of the direction we're trying. So uh, this, we just think this is very, very meaningful for us to uh, explore this direction. And yes, we have faced with some limitation in terms of the time limit, the scope, and the, our skill sets. So uh, our answer to that would be we still, do, we still would like to keep exploring AR, but with a lower priority than the 2D thing. It would just be like a, a main menu or a string that brings all the 2D pieces together. Uh, and the main content of our app will still be displayed by the 2D things. Uh, Heather, you want to ask a question? Sure, this is kind of related to Ricardo's question, but uh, or to your answer to Ricardo's question, but uh, what if I want to play this game, but I don't have convenient access to a printer to print the map? Yeah, so we also worried about that point when we designed this application. But first, we thought this will be used in the classroom setting. So we thought teachers will prepare the whole paper uh, for students. But now in the remote setting, def definitely the printer will be um, first barrier to people can um, play our application. Actually, we don't have solid answer right now, but we are considering that problem uh, very well. So I think we can uh, think about more after the half. All right, that's time. Congratulations team, good job. So if you all can turn off your videos and mute yourself, then next up, if Hygiene Care can turn on their videos and unmute themselves, then Steve will spotlight you and then we'll, we'll get going. I'll help too. 